Well, thanks very much for also joining us for this roundtable. We organize it as more a conversation and a dialogue, and we hope that you will contribute uh, after us giving uh, short presentations on particularly how we put together the special issue on uh, citizenship after Orientalism um, in the special issue in the journal Citizenship Studies. Um, as I was listening to presentations and panels over the last uh, day and a bit, uh, I was thinking also having been someone who's involved in citizenship studies and theorizing citizenship as a political, um, political intellectual project, um, I was reflecting on how things actually have changed and I was wondering to what extent those changes are actually visible. Many of, especially younger people, uh, engaged or hearing either for the first time or maybe now with their work on citizenship. Um, some of you will not remember this, but citizenship used to be a conservative concept. It was something that was dominated by the right wing, especially in the United States. It was pretty much associated with the notion of the good citizen, good citizen of the state. It's Proliferation as a radical and radicalizing concept is rather recent and it's by no means taken for granted or we shouldn't by no means take it for granted either, uh, it's radicalization. There are always um, forces struggling over it to take over the meaning of the subject and give different inflection uh, on it. So it is an ongoing struggle to give uh, various meanings to the concept, to tease out its possibilities and enable people to take up different positions with this concept is part of the academic activism that's associated with theorizing citizenship. So when we have our disagreements about how do we understand a particular uh, inflection on, let's say, deorientalizing, decolonizing, and so on, and when we register our disagreements about whether that concept is more appropriate or we should include this or that uh, perspective in our understanding of citizenship, it is also remembered to, uh, it's also important to remember that as a political intellectual project over the last 15 years, it has come, it has become a different field uh, in the way in which, for example, Anka was saying citizenship is a contested field. There was a moment, there was a time that that statement itself would have fallen on deaf ears and there are spaces, also it's important to re remember, there are spaces where it would full, fall on deaf ears. So it's important to remember both its uh, theoretical genealogy and the political genealogy of um, when we are engaged with the concept of citizenship with critical reflections. Now, it's even more so when we begin to take the assumption uh, at heart that there is a relationship between citizenship and Orientalism and that citizenship itself as, a, as an expression of a particular prioritized political subjectivity would not have come into being without articulating a series of uh, inferior other subjectivities, whether these are articulated as exclusions, otherness, uh, difference, that it would uh, not have been possible to articulate and uh, the idea of citizenship as, as, as a particular political subjectivity anchored in a nation state homogeneously conceived without also initiating a project of giving primacy to its being, it being Western construction or it being a European invention. So the fact that um, citizenship and Orientalism, when they are phrased together, also problematizes the historical origins of uh, citizenship and in the way in which it's been articulated as political questions is part of this academic activism. It's important to remember uh, that particular struggle we are implicitly or explicitly engaged in. Uh, when you look at the special issue we put together, for example, uh, there are um, 
I think 20, I don't remember the actual number, I think 20 papers, which I didn't even think that we would have when we first organized the symposium. I didn't think that we would be able to put together um, a special issue of a journal with 20 articles that would, in different ways, addressing um, questions of the relationship between citizenship and Orientalism. So it caught me by surprise. Um, first, the reaction to the first symposium that we organized, but also after the symposium, how many people actually were um, happy to send their papers in, thinking that their papers were contributing to this project. So in a sense, that was a significant moment of transformation in the new phase of politicizing or political theorizing um, of citizenship. And when you look at the um, table of contents today, it is also important to remember that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, a journal special issue with this table of contents would have been in many ways inconceivable. Uh, it would not have registered as a discursive, discursively meaningful table of contents, contents that one would engage with. Um, or it would have been not articulable and sayable either uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or 20 years ago. When you look at the chapter, uh, article titles, Orientalism, Political Subjectivity, and Birth of Citizenship in Colonies, Subverting Orientalism, Political Subjectivity in Edmund Burke, uh, The Emergence of the Other Sexual Citizen, Orientalism and the Modernization of sex Sexuality, or um, playing with citizenship um, as, as a title. These are not just simply uh, empirical and theoretical contributions, but also they are performatively indicating that we are playing with citizenship and we have taken the right to play with citizenship. That's an important uh, re um, remain, uh, reminder as well that the politics of engaging with citizenship, in the way in which we are engaging as academic uh, activists, um, if you wish we can articulate that, elaborate on that concept a little bit more later on, but as academic activists, the, the right to play with citizenship has not come about without struggle. And it is uh, significant to remember the genealogy of that uh, struggle. Now, the three concepts when we were playing with citizenship and the three particular questions that presented themselves that we thought we should address in presence, in your presence, especially with respect to the special issue but also the type of work that we are doing within the project were, one, we thought it would be good to address the question of how does thinking about Orientalism contribute to critical citizenship studies? If you like a little rephrasing, the way in which we play with citizenship now by opening its geographic and epistemic boundaries. How does it come about? How does it turn around and make a contribution to a particular field in which the struggles over the meaning of citizenship are taking place? Second question we even further specified and said, can political subjectivities be really conceived without or after Orientalism? Is this possible to pose, um, the, is it possible to imagine or conceive political subjectivities without or after Orientalism? This is particularly on the issue of after that we struggle. Um, the temporal and epistemic sense of that term. And then the third, what are the political implications of thinking about citizenship after Orientalism? Now, this is not necessarily a question about the field itself, but the broader political implications of what does it mean when we play with citizenship in the way in which we play, and when it contributes to citizenship studies or critically reflecting on it, what political implications can we draw on this with empirical examples? 
thinking about citizenship after Orientalism? Those three questions are not questions that we feel that we have answered, but in the process of articulating. And in my opening remarks, I said that in the way in which we are conceiving the project and the, the title of the subtitle of this uh, special issue captures that well, an unfinished project. And it will remain an unfinished project. It is not a project that can be finished in the sense that we will continue to explore, articulate uh, questions and invite others to take up these questions, rephrase them, and rethink them and create a space of um, critical reflection on um, citizenship. These are the three questions obviously trouble us and we reflect on. And what we are going to now, we are going to go around the table uh, to uh, address some of these questions, not necessarily in the order on, in which I um, stated them, and not necessarily everyone responding to every one of those questions, but how each of these questions enter into specific projects that are taking place um, now. I'm going to hand it over now to Leticia to start. Thank you, Inge. <clears throat> so, my way to speak to these questions would be by pausing and thinking in the after, in after orientalism. Thinking as work in progress without after. <laughs> so my first point is related to the tension to which the after is exposed. In our context, of course, after doesn't mean overcoming and cannot mean overcoming. But at the same time, it needs to need, to need overcoming in some way. For instance, we need to reject Orientalism for political reasons. Or, if not overcome, defeat, oppose Orientalist views in the different process of Orientalization that we are seeing. And we also see the echoes of the idea of overcoming for theoretical reasons when we embark in the task of critique. So if we talk about the intellectual stake of this project, I would say that the after, with all its ambiguity, is that the after brings a temporal sequence, and this is highly problematic. The after may well imply to leave something behind. It implies a before in the most literal sense. So the question arises, what is the reference point of this temporality where the after is named, evoked? What is this place, or where is this space, and the scope in geopolitical terms of this after? But together with this, the after also brings the echoes of the trace. It evokes the idea of effect or effectuation, and therefore after might also signal a political direction or commitment, an idea, a horizon, and also a relation to responsibility or better put, answerability. The after works in the sense as a marker of the commitment made not from the position of or as a sovereign subject, but as one that is constituted through that answerability that binds us to each other. Fourth, another risk that the idea of after is faced with, to my, in my view, is that the after, with all its temporal weight, might suggest that Orientalism is something that is there and is distinct from its multiple articulations. So here we arrive to the point where we can see that the problem might not be so much the after, but the meaning of Orientalism itself. How do we understand it? So if in the easiest sense we can link, link the after of citizenship to an, an after Orientalism or classic Orientalism, I would say, Looking at the conditions of possibility of these discursive re-articulations of new formations of, of Orientalism, if it's the first after we might think of, maybe not the first after, 
but the need to dwell in these kind of irresolvable contradictions. So thank you. What I'm bringing. Thanks, Patricia. Um, you raised some interesting points about um, the problems, of, but also potential about the term after. Um, after is not something which is um, which is overcoming, defeating, opposing, but um, trying to get away from uh, the post-colonial, the idea of the post as, as being temporary after. And I think that's what's quite original about um, putting the question in, in this way, of can political subjectivities be conceived without or after Orientalism? Now, Leticia addressed after. I'd like to address um, without. You may say that um, the question of uh, can political subjectivities be conceived without um, Orientalism has already been addressed in um, post-colonial studies, for instance. We have a wealth of literature from Franz Fanon, from Du Bois, from uh, countless theories have, have, have appeared to address this. Now, what I want to do is highlight the novelty of our question um, and its specificity. And in doing so, um, perhaps, although Engin said um, we haven't um, really found a full answer to it, and we, we may not, this is an unfinished project, um, I'd like to point uh, a methodological approach which could help us address it. Um, for instance, let me take the example of Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon addressed how we can think about the citizen after colonialism, the citizen after racism. He used the term man, but he also, uh, as he's most famously known for, uh, um, thinking about setting the new man foot. But he also, in the pitfalls of nationalism, also talked about um, addressing, uh, accelerating a citizen's consciousness. He talked about um, we need to get rid of the idea of the tribe and bring about uh, which was uh, hindering the national project, although Fanon never ended with the national project. He was arguing that um, we should be imagining a political subjectivity after colonialism, after racism, after nationalism. The citizen was a way, a means to this end. Now, for me, um, if Fanon addressed colonialism, racism, he didn't address political orientalism. He didn't address the idea that the citizen was the route to, to emancipation. He, he adopted that same um, teleological framework. And this is what we're, in a friendly critique of Fanon, this is what we're trying to, what I feel I'm trying to address. For me, this spells a new question. It spells the question of, we need, we need to be decolonizing those who represent decolonization. And by putting it in these terms, I think we need to constantly be critical of um, our ideas of what decolonization is, what de-Westernization is, and um, what de-Orientalizing means as well as um, the last panel um, put forward. Now, in terms of trying to address this, I feel that where this, where this particular thought took me was to uh, multiculturalism. Now that, that might seem surprising because multiculturalism, um, it's for everyone in the audience, it's going to have a different meaning, a different register. And it's very hard to um, express what I mean about multiculturalism without an already preconceived idea about it being either uh, liberal, um, promoting racism, promoting anti-racism, uh, around ideas of constituting plurinational states or simply reinforcing the sovereignty of a single nation state or, or whether it's even, uh, or in the early 90s, it was an idea about a polycentric multiculturalism. But even so, we can perhaps, dare I say, also pluriversality, as what Mignolo talked about yesterday. Multiculturalism is in a, another way, it's another language. Because multiculturalism has become discredited, a bit like communism, um, the, the language, the discourse of it, um, we have to invent new words for some reason. But my idea is um, about trying to think about tracing this idea of what it really is. What is multiculturalism trying to address? And I felt what multiculturalism is trying to address, was trying to address, not from a status perspective, not from even a um, conviviality, but from a kind of a problem which lies underneath that. And that problem, I think, we can name, as I've named, um, difference management. Now, 
What I tried to do in the article on citizenship studies was try to separate um, difference management away from um, diversity management from various um, different, <laughs> sorry for the lack of words, but different conceptions of, um, of what it means to manage a population. Not simply in governmentality terms, biopolitics, but also the idea of, of what it means to live together in a, in a kind of harmonious way or a disharmonious way. And racism actually contributes to the idea of harmony. And that's, this is the, and racism contributes, obviously, to, as we know, the critical ideas of, of exclusion. But I want to trace this genealogical approach to say, let's be critical of ourselves, let's be critical of, of, of where anti-racism takes us. And I think by deorientalizing citizenship, the kind of political subjectivities we can see of without orientalism is turning to the traces of, um, for instance, of multiculturalism in the past, for instance, of how uh, the British government has sought to manage populations, not as a positive element or a negative element, not whether we're siding with Nell Ferguson or whether we're siding with um, post-colonial theorists, but whether we're um, trying to see the strands of, of um, indirect real, the strands of, of um, liberalism, of communitarianism, through colonialism, through post-colonial governments, and how do these impact our, um, our conceptions of what it means to be liberated through this idea of a political subject, post-colonial political subject, as Strabby put it, or, uh, or even as a subject which is beyond the post-colonial. Thank you, Zaki. Um, I'm really glad that you mentioned Franz Fanon because in answering these questions, I thought it was... Us? <laughs> Sorry. Is it okay? Is that it? Yes. Okay. So, um, in answering these questions, I thought it was really important to also go back to these original post-colonial thinkers, and I think specifically the work of Edward Said. So, in Orientalism, Edward Said discusses Flaubert, and he discusses Flaubert's relationship with the Egyptian courtesan, Kachak Hanem. He writes, the Orient was Orientalized not only because it was discovered to be Oriental in all those ways considered commonplace by an average 19th century European, but also because it could be, that is, submitted to being made Oriental. He continues, there is very little consent to be found, for example, in the fact that Flaubert's encounter with an Egyptian courtesan produced a widely influential model of the Oriental woman. She never spoke for herself. She never represented her emotions, presence, or history. He spoke for her and represented her. He was foreign, comparatively wealthy, male. And these were historical factors that allowed him to not only possess Kachekhanem physically, but to speak for her and tell his readers in what way she was typically Oriental. Now what's interesting is that Said goes on to discuss this relationship between Flaubert and the courtesan as standing in for a pattern of strength between East and West. So he says their relationship fairly stands for the pattern of strength between East and West. And I begin with the example because I believe that Said's words can offer a great deal to contemporary studies of citizenship and for my own purposes specifically regarding gender and sexual citizenship. So this idea of who speaks and who has authority to make authorial claims and to then hold political authority is still with us. And I have an image actually if I can show you. So in December, 2011, um, the United Nations, uh, yeah, no, go back, sorry. The United Nations um, declared uh, the day of the girl child. So they have this campaign that was launched um, and it says discrimination and violence against girls happens and it's interesting to think that this happened shortly after September 11th. And then if we look at the images that you can find on the United Nations website, there is an over-representation of children like this. Girl children who are predominantly from the South Asian subcontinent, many pictures of young Muslim girls. And we can ask again, who is speaking for whom? And who is being represented? And I think 
what I was interested in in my um, article in Citizenship Studies was this figure of the victimized gendered subject, which appears again and again. And you can see it in films like Born into Brothels, this constant narrative of the gendered subject in the so-called Orient, who is often figured as a child or weak, in need of care, in need of missionary-type rescue. And what is interesting, I think, is to think about how, if we go back to Saeed, this is not just an example, I think, of gendered um, oppression or gendered power relations, but how can we see this relationship as standing in for a wider global political relationship of strength? So this kind of figure of a victimized child. And if we're going to conceive of political subjectivity after beyond Orientalism, then I think we need to be completely aware of this kind of originary Orientalist moment and think about who still has authority and how if we then want to conceive of citizenship after Orientalism, I think we need to look at modes of political subjectivity in which people who are often represented as victims, in fact, articulate forms of politics outside of this kind of framework. And my work is mainly on hijras for this reason. So my work is looking at hijras in India who, in a secular translation, would be referred to as transgendered persons, and looking at the ways in which they occupy public spaces and often engage in um, very confrontational public performances where they will ask passers-by for money and if they don't get money, they will shame them by showing passers-by their genitals. Like these kind of confrontational performances. But the reason I was really interested in looking at the hitra was how can we look at these modes of subjectivity as a means of moving away from the oriental victim figure, right? From the one who is always seen to be weak and oppressed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad that uh, Leticia brought and broadened the idea of after. And uh, particularly, I really liked that uh, uh, one of the possibility or difficulties of after is um, after as a trace. And uh, I would like to come back to that. Um, my paper appeared in Citizenship Studies um, was um, basically a kind of historical anthropological study of a um, religious institution called Mata in South India. And Matas um, have been translated as a monastery or anyway treated as a very, very religious institution uh, headed by a um, figure of a guru. Um, but it's not really monastery in the sense of a Christian monastery or Buddhist monastery where only renouncers uh, live together or share some sort of secluded um, lifestyle. But this is actually much, much more uh, open institution. And uh, especially in South India, it has becoming or began to acquire some sort of um, um, state-like characters. So they organize, they run free schools, or sometimes they charge, but mostly quite good private schools. And um, they also run um, free hospitals in rural India. Um, and also they organize um, kind of informal court where villagers can bring their own, um, say, often family disputes and sometimes village disputes, and the guru uh, gives some solution. So I, I was interested in this institution and also particularly interested in political and social role this particular institution plays in rural India. And um, I wanted to I start, I think, in my paper uh, talking about a kind of very 
foundational kind of political orientalism and especially Engin uh, often talks about, especially um, uh, Weber and I added a little bit of Hegel, basically uh, the only Europe can develop um, citizenship or civil society because only Europe managed to get rid of um, kind of a community based on kinship, religious, affect, uh, religious, religious affiliation, maybe affect. You, you, but only Europe managed to create different sort of uh, community or civil society uh, or virtual society where individual enters this space uh, form kind of contractual relationship with the state as an, again, individual. On that basis, only proper citizenship appears. And of course, as uh, so often Engin um, um, says, this, this is nothing but political orientalism. The Orient plays as something which is not Europe. Europe needs Europe to be um, centralized and homogeneous and unitary development of democracy to believe in this uh, genealogy they need the Orient. So of course we all want to uh, contradict and also uh, criticize this but just to present something not European, not I don't know modern as an example I think somebody has already pointed out this morning uh, might fall into a uh, kind of essentialization or maybe just to please nativism, you know, yesterday also we talked about, it is not good enough to bring counterexample to say, no, this also works, or maybe Orient works differently. That also still creates this uh, distinction and not only essentialize and exoticize the Orient, but also I think prioritize the centrality of Europe again as a consequence. And I think that is really, really um, kind of difficult uh, thing to uh, overcome. So I think what we need to do is actually to look at, actually as an anthropologist, I feel what we need to do is one of the way to, well, not necessarily overcome, but to show something somewhere, some sort of open up some sort of space is that to look at each cases and empirically and critically. And therefore, I feel this after means, especially in my case, this is a trace. So this is a, this particular religious institution is not just conservative, traditional, some sort of um, mini state outside of the nation state or something um, managed to survive um, kind of not really tamed by um, modernity or colonialism. It is much more response to the very much colonial governmentality, uh, modernity, a developmental state structure of India. So this is very much modern and political entity. It's just historical and geographical contingency made this particular institution as it is. So I think to, to understand this, I think is the, one of the ways to go probably to recognize this after as a trace. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm the last one on the table, so most of the things are almost said, but I still have some some things to reflect on. Um, my article on in this special issue called something like Orientalizing Citizenship Regimes refers to how the European Union uh, legitimizes the border regime, citizenship regime, by constructing the other, the imminent other, this is the, the migrant, as the, the illegal, the criminal, the the, well, I would say the, the, even the terrorist. Uh, and this gives uh, the argument of, of, of Sartori, Giovanni Sartori, Italian author, that says the, the anti citizen. So I think 
that uh, one of the best ways of answering this this question, as Engin mentioned, was by uh, bringing an image. Uh, it's an image of the field work I'm undertaking now. Uh, especially, how do people, in this case migrants, uh, resist or react against this orientalization? And I wanted to bring this this picture, this photograph of women and children, uh, especially the two women in the center, or in the one, the one with the microphone, and the one next to her. One is Rifat, and the other one is Faisal. Uh, both came from from Pakistan to Barcelona in the last decade. One first arrived. Uh, from Pakistan to Norway and then together with her husband to, to Barcelona and the other one traveled with a reunification, family reunification permit that her husband had requested. And both used to spend their daily lives at home, taking care of their children and occasionally helping their husbands in, in their husband's businesses. However, at the 19th of January of 2008, everything changed for them. Uh, there was the new, a new spread uh, all around the, the neighborhood of El Raval, where they lived, because 14 people from Pakistan and India had been arrested, accused of belonging to a terrorist cell that was apparently planning, still planning, uh, to bomb the metro of the Barcelona of the city. And among these detainees, there was the brother of one and the cousin of the other. During this year, this week, the following week, uh, fear was felt in the community, the Pakistani community, because the, there could be new arrests, new detentions. Uh, police were doing uh, informal and formal raids and, and going into to the doors, knocking the doors and asking questions and in a very, uh, I would say, frightening way. But however, these women, Faisal and Rifat, together with other relatives and migrant uh, organizations that struggle for migrant rights, decided to organize a public meeting or demonstration in the square of El Raval in Barcelona. That day, for the first time in their lives, these women, Rifat and Faisal, held a microphone and read a um, um, political, what I would say, manifesto in public. They called against terrorism, but also they, they asked for dignity of immigrants. They also called for the release of their brothers, husbands, sons, cousins, or friends. That day, these women, uh, together with, with uh, I would say, uh, ten more, they led a demonstration along the, the streets of Barcelona, followed by mostly uh, men and other people. Um, there are different ways of interpreting this uh, this act. I would say one would be that they were uh, that way that they were driven uh, by emotion. They, they carried along by emotion uh, or subordination. I would say. But in, current, in contrast, uh, that day, Rifat and Faisal became, became at least uh, unknowingly or probably unintentionally political actors. Although they could not be considered citizens because of their uh, foreigner status, in my opinion, they became activists against being orientalized. If we don't remove uh, the lens of Orientalism when describing this photograph, we would have never been able to focus the action of these two women. Nobody would have ever seen new political sector subjectivity in Rifat's and Faisal's act. So maybe when talking about citizenship after Orientalism, I would add uh, citizenship beyond Orientalism. Thank you. Thanks very much for all your contributions and um, of course this is not all of the projects that are 
included in the uh, broader project. Uh, we have also others who are in the audience now. They are going to also come into uh, the dialogue. But just to remind you the questions that trouble us as we articulate our uh, research projects. And then I want to ask you what other questions you think we should be troubled by. So in other words, we're going to turn the attention uh, to you and then ask questions, give us more questions um, that, that should trouble us. Um, one of them, of course, uh, Walter Mignolo has given one, and I want to come back to that, if possible, today in my concluding remarks, which was, what do we want? I've been told that it's Freud's question and then Lenin's question, but it's Walter's question in this uh, symposium. So he was physically present here, so it's his. Um, obviously, the question is striking in its simplicity, but also its directness. It's on the one hand seductive to take up that position that we can perhaps answer it, but in the way in which I would answer it will be a lot more roundabout than being tempted to take the seductive um, uh, route of giving a straightforward answer. So I want to come back to that. But that's a question that he articulated. Uh, what do we want? And the ones that we troubled us, how does thinking about Orientalism contribute to theorizing citizenship? Can political subjectivities be conceived without or after Orientalism? And what are the political implications of thinking about citizenship after Orientalism? So you might wonder, as uh, someone who is not only doing a project within this broader project, but also someone who is in a position of um, articulating uh, principles, ways of thinking and contributing to theorizing citizenship with these projects, you might wonder how does he hold these together? Forget about the 13 projects that are taking place, but just these five that you heard. Uh, when I was presented with that problem, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, it, it, right when I was writing the introductory um, article to the special issue, I have gradually come to articulate three modalities, not mutually exclusive uh, modalities, not necessarily also temporarily arranged uh, modalities, and they are not reducible to one another either, but three ways in which I saw the projects began articulating ways of theorizing citizenship after Orientalism. One set of studies, um, or projects were focused on undoing Orientalism um, and undoing Orientalism in citizenship. And undoing takes various forms. For example, in Leticia's uh, research, we see how sexual Orientalism is being reconfigured and how various relationships between Europe and its others are articulated through lens of sexual citizenship that has been um, formed in the metropole, as it were. So it is um, after Orientalism, that project is after, not so much as in temporarily having Orientalism ended what it looks like, but how it continues in its traces to um, reconfigure geopolitics, if you like. And in the case of, for example, the, the second category, uh, the first one is undoing, the uncovering. Um, Aya's work is directly relevant in, in places and institutions where we are not necessarily inclined to see political subjectivity. There is, in the, there is indeed a form of political subjectivity being enacted. We have to develop the tools to recognize, understand, and comprehend these claims and the ways in which they uh, articulate different forms of rights. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't conform to our already established categories. That's why we have to gingerly, meticulously, and um, rigorously pursue empirical studies to unearth, un uh, reveal, 
and disclose the ways in which political subjectivities are formed. That's what the term uncovered tries to uh, address. And then there are inventive moments, inventive acts. Uh, they are um, moments worthy for consideration or deeper analysis, inventive moments and acts through which political subjectivity is almost as if burst into the scene, create a scene, and articulate what it might involve. Um, I think of, for example, Hydra flashing their genitals in the presence of respectable citizens is an inventive moment, an inventive act where a lot of questions are asked about authority, recognition, um, understanding, subjectivity. All of those questions are thrown up in the air uh, as if to pick up the pieces it requires an investigator to, to give full uh, force to that uh, act. So there are those moments of inventiveness. And Iker's uh, example is another moment of invent inventiveness where the unsuspected subjects burst into scene and present themselves as political subjects without having any authorization or prior um, prior legitimation, whether one could do that or not. And that's a moment of uh, inventiveness. So you can see from this that there are different modes through which, there are different angles one can enter into the question of uh, citizenship after Orientalism. It's by no means singular, either in its results or its in approaches. But at the same time, it gathers around increasingly a richer and deeper uh, understanding of political subjectivity where citizenship no longer appears the way it was or citizenship no longer can afford to appear the way it used to. That's what I mean by unsettling, Makes, making it difficult. In fact, when I go to rather less radical, rather less open conferences where I'm asked to speak about citizenship, I'm often either confronted with or ask specific questions. Sometimes they come in um, um, veiled as friendly but hostile questions or openly hostile questions about, you know, what are you trying to do, where this is going to end. You keep stretching this out of any recognition and it no longer, you know, appears as though it is citizenship. And that's exactly the also provocation. Uh, the provocation is I'm not so much worried about the homogeneity and co coherence of a, an idea of citizenship that I want to hold in my head and then go around and tell people that's how they should be thinking about citizenship in terms of its content. Rather, I'd, I'd like us to see, invite uh, us to think critically about citizenship in that moment of unsettling. Because as soon as you unsettle, you recognize that um, at one point, it was put together inherently, that field and that particular subject position called citizenship is not given. It does not have the historical stability that is given to it. It's by no means, for example, when one performatively constructs citizenship as being invented by the Greeks, when you actually start uh, scratching the surface and unsettle that, uh, the point, the political point there is that the, that which you think is stable is not. Then it raises the question, well, if it is not stable, what accounts for its stability? Who makes it stable? Uh, I think in the earlier panel, uh, Gurman there was asking, what makes the citizen, rather than who is the citizen? What process goes into stabilizing these inherently unstable concepts? So there's a historical instability to citizenship that needs to be provoked. But that instability is not only historical, it is also political. Uh, it does not have the coherence and homogeneity that is attributed to it when it's performatively brought into being by various people saying that, you know, French citizenship stands for this. And then when questions arise, well, it may also stand for this, it also stands for that. It destabilizes, and it's that moment of destability is significant to think through um, theorizing uh, citizenship. 
Now, with that, I want to turn to, the, these are the things that, um, uh, questions that trouble us. These are the ways in which we struggle to also bring, not necessarily coherence and homogeneity, but certain um, stability with the knowledge that that stability is also temporal. For some, it might be bothersome aspect of the way in which we theorize. For some others, it isn't. So there is an a almost um, ontological, political difference in here in the way in which one approaches a, a particular concept. Those are the questions that trouble us. Um, you are not, in some ways, unfamiliar to us. In a way, as I said in our opening remark, we feel that we have engaged a conversation with an emerging public, or publics if you like. And that conversation is taking place various, uh, through various means. But nonetheless, still, we would like to give you this opportunity to ask questions that trouble you, that you think that trouble should trouble us. Um, we lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> Meida, Anke, and Nicola. Okay, let's start with three. Okay, I was told that I'm not the most, well, I was the naughty girl of the symposium. I was told that I am asking always critical questions, but I ask questions when I have some critical remarks. So, um, uh, now, this is not a veiled or openly hostile question at all. I, it's not veiled or it's not open, but it's not it's not hostile. But I am troubled with the very phrase the orientalize. Or phrases like after orientalism and so on, or these terms. Undoing orientalism. I don't think we're undoing it. It's undone. It's not orient de orientalized and it's not after at all. We are with Orientalism in different forms. But when in the academia we, we meant these things to, to, to refer to certain things, which I understand. But then I am also troubled with the fact that Orientalism to me is a very specific phenomenon. I also get a bit uneasy when the term is applied to the context of Africa. Uh, I don't think it is applicable to that con context. It, Saeed's or I, I'm probably ter ter too much Saeedian in that sense. I mean, I'm loyal to him, I'm critical of him, but uh, there's a very specific context that he uses or he refers to when he talks about Orientalism. And I don't think it can easily be applied to Africa or Latin America, there's something specific about Orientalism. So when we think of uh, the Orientalizing citizen, citizenship, why do we want to think, I was really puzzled with this in the beginning. It took me a while to sort, it out, sort out what, what was being referred to. Uh, so I would have used, not, I don't mean to say that this is a better or correct version or anything, far from it. But citizenship immediately brings into mind thinking of the nation state and even Yasem in Soysal some years, years ago talked about the post-national uh, forms of citizenship. So I tend to think citizenship in, along those lines, I mean the immediate uh, terms or issues that come along with it, I would not have taught the orientalizing. If we are the, talking about the orientalizing it in my mind, then we have to specifically, maybe you will think I'm a bit pervert, I just think in a very limited way, or, yeah, but this is how I'm thinking. So if, if we're specifically talking about the orientalizing citizenship, we have to refer to the issue of Islam. I don't want to be regarded as this person obsessed with issues of Islam and so on and so forth, but it necessarily is about that is, that's why I refer to Said's specificity of Orientalism. And um, the issue, 
even to, in terms like that, uh, like queering the nation, to me, is alien. Queering is about other thing. Well, I won't get into that, but it's like when terms, specific terms, with their heavy loads of meaning and reference, are used in a different context, they puzzle me, and then I tr start looking for the specificity of that uh, issue there, in that context. And I thought the Orientalizing citizenship is necessarily in, brings the issue of Islam. Islam is pressuring, it, it is a vital issue now in the world. I mean, we have to deal with one way or another in terms of citizenship, as and um, political movements and whatever. Uh, I honestly was a, not able to find the trace of this, uh, this issue being underlined. Uh, uh, issues of secularism and religion, absolutely central, I would say, to issues of or the orientalizing citizenship, if you want to use the term. So there I found a bit those issues missing. Am I wrong or do you think? Um, thanks. I think I will directly connect to that, but before I do that, I would like to refer to an unsettling moment that I found really nice in your presentation, and this was when um, Tara brought up this um, image, and she was talking about um, victimizing um, gendered, um, the victimized gendered subject as a political subject. Um, which I find very important also in reference to what I've been talking about. But then we had a photograph um, that was, from my point of view, not the um, photograph of a victimized um, gendered subject or victimized girls, but these were girls that were looking in out to, uh, to, to our eyes, that were um, laughing, maybe about to speak, that um, stood shoulder to sh um, shoulder, that were not isolated. And what I found really nice was this oh baby that you put on top of it. And I wonder why you did it. Um, you didn't comment on it. But um, it was a direct interpolation to me. I was addressed um, and I was infantilized. Um, is that the term? Yeah. Um, so I found myself in this position where I am the baby, where I am suddenly kind of like in a position of dependency, of um, interrelationality um, with the, those two young girls um, who claim a citizenship space. And I thought that was de-orientalizing in a way. I found that really nice. <laughs> Uh, and for me, writing my own paper, it was actually nice that it was de-orientalizing citizenship and not de-orientalized citizenship. And I was, I mean, it produced some grammatical um, challenges, but I tried to stick to that, to actually stick to this um, unfinished project or the continuous um, um, process of de-orientalizing. And um, for me, it was exactly, uh, or not exactly, it was, it was the question of how this does, how does this actually relate to this other question of queering citizenship um, that I brought up and that you were um, referring to just now, um, saying that queering is a way of trying to articulate difference without referring to categorizations which um, I think is also something that's um, implicit in this uh, moment of deorientalizing. Um, but then I think um, Maida's question are very um, correct. So what is actually the scope of the Oriental? So there is a reference to the Muslim, there's also a reference to um, the Jewish um, history as part of the um, Oriental. Um, field and there we have a specific um, tension we have to, to um, acknowledge. And I would like to pose a question really how you um, as um, the project refer to this um, moment that I kind of like try to bring into the debate with the querying as articulating difference without um, categorization and then this moment that Fatima Altaya brings up 
saying um, this is not a single subject citizen speaking here, but it's a question of um, alliance building, alliances um, without referring to essential um, categories. So I think that that's one of the questions I would like to put to you. Thanks. Uh, Nicola Milanese from European Alternatives. You said, Engin, that um, I think it was your second question or your second uh, concern was about whether political subjectivity is possible after deorientalizing citizenship. And I think I have a, a concern about each one of those terms. The first one um, I think is not unfamiliar to you. It's probably one of the hostile attacks that you already had about uh, the danger of everything becoming political. And if everything becomes political, uh, then uh, it's not clear what the difference is between what's political and what isn't political. Um, and there's, there's a risk, surely, that in deorientalizing citizenship, you're not so much uh, going around telling people what they ought to think about citizenship, but you might be going around presuming what they ought to think about politics or what is a political act. It's not very clear uh, what the difference is, even if you look in a very situated uh, way at various acts, where the political act is, whether it's in your interpretation or in your enunciation of what they're doing, or whether it's actually in their, um, in their conception of it themselves. That's a familiar problem from, from anthropology. Uh, the second uh, term is, is, is related, it seems to me, sub subjectivity, the political subjectivity. Uh, and there the question, uh, or concern that comes to my mind is about um, uh, citizenship as a collective uh, concept or action. That if we're talking about people as, as citizens, they're citizens not on their own, they're citizens with other citizens and might need to conceive of themselves as part of a group or a collective. And in, in, in performing a political act, performing, performing it on behalf of and then you need to have an answer to the question on behalf of who. Um, and then you have the very difficult problem of, of the scale of uh, justice or the scale of political act and identifying the, the holistic group uh, the political act comes from. So there were my two concerns. Um, yeah, I think the conversation is really good, so I'd like to take another three. Um, it's continuing so um, um, I forgot the names I'm sorry you the person behind you you and that one those, those four let's take those four uh, I can relate to one I start for one of the uh, uh, your uh, Sorry? Your name, please, your name. Uh, uh, Ricardo Baldissone Berbeck. Uh, I'd like to start from Zaki's uh, paper and then multiculturalism to express my concern to you. Uh, it seems to me that multiculturalism already happened many centuries ago when the missionaries uh, went to South America and, and saw so the other humans and say, keep your feathers but get our God. Now, this trick is still happening, it seems to me. Uh, there's still someone who says, keep your feathers, but get our God. Now, there are avatars of God, and it could be the omnipotent lawgiver in the words of Schmidt, or, or the concept of nature, uh, that seems to me even a more important avatar of God. But this, the problem with multiculturalism is that if you recognize a multiplicity at, at the level of cultures, there is the risk, and a bit more than the risk, that you suppose that you have to accept something that is underlying cultures, something ontological, that is nature as described by Western sciences. So uh, it is not possible, in my view, to translate multiculturalism into the pluriverse or the multiverse because the concept of the multiverse was devised by William James to deal with religions so that there was a kind of real multiplicity 
or universes. That's my question. Behind you. Um, thank you. Uh, Jason Fernandes from the University of Lisbon. Um, I want to um, just underline the, the issue I think um, Leticia brought up, which was uh, deorientalizing, is it possible at all, right? And I'm, uh, that's not what you said. Oh, okay, that's what you said. Okay. Um, and um, I, I think I just want to underline it as a project that uh, may not be complete. It's a project worth taking on, but perhaps we should not kid ourselves that we can get around it. And uh, I'd like to demonstrate a manner in which the attempt at deorientalizing perhaps could lead to very strange consequences, which are not at all emancipatory. Take, for example, the manner. What happens, for example, to, and this is why my fear of the, na of the nativism that I spoke about yesterday. Uh, what happens, for example, to people who are not seen as authentic, right? Take, for example, the Goan Catholics or the Christians of India that I, that I study. Um, it's assumed almost universally, even within the academy, in sophisticated and not so sophisticated ways, that to be Indian is to be Hindu. Therefore, when one, when, when one examines the Christian, they are somehow seen as non-authentic subjects. So therefore, they have to return to a certain state of authenticity and from then on begin their political actions, right? Um, and invariably, act their actions are not seen as authentic if they're Christian. They have to work from another space. Um, and this is complicated also because there's also been, I think, a certain tendency to look at the issue from Britain. But there were empires besides Britain. Uh, and Britain uh, and, and and London is not the only uh, metropolis, right? So I think uh, Bovintura Santosh captures it really well, where he says, uh, "Look at those colonized by the Portuguese, right? They are represented by the Portuguese, but the Portuguese themselves are in some sense colonized by the British, and the Portuguese are represented by the British, right?" So what happens to the poor uh, Portuguese colonized person? By how many persons is he represented? And when you're attempting to deorientalize, um, which representation are you undoing? And which representation are you uh, reaffirming? So I think the, the, when you look at the issue outside of the context of British colonialism or British imperialism, the situation gets much murkier and messier. But that does not mean we should not take on the project. Um, the other issue is, uh, I, I, I had problems with the whole idea of de-Westernization. My question being, why do you want to de-Westernize? We want to be Western. We want to be like you, right? Um, where I come from, no one wants to be uh, uh, Indian or, whatever, or um, I read this wonderful paper, I forget who by, uh, we don't want to be African, we want to be Western. The problem, however, is, um, that we are being told, no, don't be Western, both by those well-meaning as well as those who are not so well-meaning, who want to de-emphasize a racial distinction. Uh, decolonization, in fact, is the beginning of a certain other racial project, right, of marking white spaces and non-white spaces. Um, the the, the so possible solu uh, option for uh, to, to this question is that therefore we need to reclaim Europe when people outside of Europe non-white persons are saying we want to be Western they're not saying that they want to be white but they're they they they, they, they laying claim to certain ideas that, that are seen as part of of the Western tradition but they're laying claim to it and in doing so they they could possibly change the very nature of it. Right? So de-Westernization may not really capture the, um, the complexity of what, what, what these persons outside of the West are attempting to do. And therefore, I'm saying, very often people speak about expanding Europe. And yes, let's expand Europe, but that, that idea of Europe may not be an idea that the EU, for example, would, would like very much. Um, and finally, um, this is, I'm, I'm going back to something Medha said uh, yesterday. Um, of the Anglo-American uh, Academy being against the nation state. I'm not sure you'll agree with what I say subsequently, 
But um, there's also a certain need for us to reclaim empire. Um, certain empires did allow for a certain space of citizenship that uh, tends to be largely excluded when, um, when, we, when we look at empire. Empire is like the big bad boy that needs to be, um, that needs to be castigated at every turn. Uh, and the options that existed within empire, this is really interesting work by Karen Baki on the um, Ottoman Empire. Um, don't don't get focused on as 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 much as um, as it ought to because of this kind of focus, either positively or negatively, against the nation state. Thank you. I'm Sukanya Banerjee from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Uh, first of all, I would actually like to thank all of you and the entire project team for a wonderful uh, round of conversation exchanges that we've been enjoying for the past two days. And in a way, I'm glad and heartened that this is an unfinished project because I'm really looking forward to more that's coming uh, from you. Um, I just had a larger question about uh, the theme um, around which you have organized the project. Uh, I mean, the question of uh, deorientalizing citizenship emerges because, as you've laid out, uh, you see citizenship as originating in Europe. And that's exactly what I would like for you to push a little bit further. I would like for you to think more about how citizenship, modern citizenship, is much more multi-sided in provenance. And, um, you know, to uncover as part of, as the project of uncovering, to entail the process of revealing in its viscosity the entangling alliances and the cross hatchings uh, that actually bring about citizenship in the form that we recognize and then hope to deconstruct. But I think at its very root, we need to really problematize that association to begin with, because if we don't do that, uh, we are actually already ceding ground to the legacies of colonial history, which have erased uh, the contingencies through which uh, the idea of citizenship uh, in you know, 18th, 19th centuries uh, really cohered and constellated. So. This is more like a comment uh, rather than a question. It's Goran Jovetti from uh, DOU. And uh, I was just going to uh, say something about uh, yesterday and uh, about the discussions today. Uh, firstly, on India, and it was about uh, Kashmir and uh, Nagaland. And uh, I think you know, we explored uh, Nagaland in detail, whereas Kashmir was left, you know, um, a couple of questions were unanswered about imposing citizenship on that region of India and so on. And it was, uh, it would be really great to hear about this because uh, now that uh, Foreign and Commonwealth, Commonwealth Office uh, has lifted their, <coughs> their advice against traveling in the region after 20 years, so maybe uh, at a later opportunity or something. And uh, India as a, as, a, as a country is a fascinating place, you know, it's a uh, it's a microcosm of uh, not only citizenship uh, uh, examples coming, you know, about citizenship, about just about everything else. And um, I would like to say something on the subject of uh, hijab. It was uh, mentioned by Tara. And the uh, position of uh, hijab in India is uh, kind of uh, in the Hinduism, in the Hindu society as a tolerant society, in the tolerant, tolerant religion. Uh, hijra is placed, um, uh, it has a kind of purpose. Uh, they have a, they have a mm, mm, uh, kind of authority you know, to bless and they have a, a authority to curse. Luckily, my first encounter with Hijra wasn't as dramatic that nobody dropped you know, their trousers or their skirts you know, down, uh, flashing their genitals, but it was uh, uh, shocking. Like you know, many other things in India, it would be for Westerner, uh, uh, I mean, things that are obviously that are not tragic, it would be, it would be uh, first shocking and then you shake it off laughing, you know. Um, I don't think, you know, Hijra is a subject for laugh, but uh, 
Hija uh, society, Hija caste in uh, India would be uh, 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 much more privileged than other parts, other, 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 uh, than some other uh, caste in India. And uh, uh, definitely more privileged than their counterparts in uh, British, uh, ex-British colonies like Malawi or Zimbabwe or somewhere else. Um, uh, uh, dealing with Hijra in India, uh, they have you know, this status, uh, you know, either to bless or to, to, or to curse, or maybe they have a, in, uh, in Pakistan, they have a, uh, I, I don't know, maybe you can correct me, in, in, in Pakistan, because you know, they're kind of you know, protected human beings, you know, they use them you know, to, uh, uh, to collect taxes, you know, as, as the tax collectors, you know, because nobody would, would react uh, uh, against them. Uh, and another, another thing is, <clears throat> Another thing that I was that I was going to comment about um, Charles's presentation yesterday, where is Aya? Sorry, where Aya uh, was um, slightly contradicting, you know, with her discussion today, because Charles's presentation uh, mentions that uh, adapting music uh, uh, from uh, Islam and um, and. Um, could mean that Europe is might maybe embracing a new kind of identity. I think you know that is very kind, very very nice of you. But you know, I, I think you know we, we should you know, take that a little bit uh, with with with, with, a, with a pinch of salt, with a reserve, because I think what Europe does at the moment is they're taking secular bits of Islam, they're using it you know for their purposes, and then they might be. The, 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 uh, 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 I, I think you know, this can be compared you know, to Mughal India, where where in India. Um, um, uh, places like, uh, let's say, uh, Red Fort or Lal Kila or Taj Mahal are presented now as a quintessential Indian, or even those miniature paintings, they're presented as a quintessential Indian, whereas in fact uh, uh, they have uh, roots, you know, from Muslim culture and Muslim tradition. Where I come from, it, it's, uh, it's in the Balkans, we, for 500 years, you know, we fought the Ottoman Empire, uh, we rejected everything about the Ottoman Empire and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and Islam. But now it's it's very trendy to associate, you know, to Ottoman Empire to take bits and pieces, you know, to adapt it and uh, to, to use it because it is different, it is beautiful. So I would like to say, uh, uh, so I would like to say uh, that uh, we should maybe pay. Really, I would agree, you know, to make that, that that we should pay you know, more attention. To, to, to secularism and religion, because they do have roots. Okay, so thanks very much, thank you. Uh, we have, I think, a couple more. There is one there and one there, is uh, one back in there, but th and then we will. Yes, this is just uh, a very brief comment. I'm from Sierra Leone, uh, born on the Independence Day of Sierra Leone, and um, I've just come back from Mozambique and Zimbabwe, and uh, I live here. And what's quite interesting, I just want a very brief uh, affirmation that the after in the post might be enlarged to encompass continuities of various valences that we've been talking about. Because we seem to be very, when you say after, it's a very uh, finite um, uh, feeling. And when I, what I understand by post-colonialism, when I hear that, I think of the post or the continuities in any era of post-colonialism. So, I'm 51 now, and I'm an example of the ongoing continuities of post-colonialism, which will last within the diasporic intercultural landscape of various hybridities that will keep going, especially where the um, various power dynamics, there's nothing very after about that. It's ongoing. Um, just very briefly, in terms of de-Westernization, I totally relate to your point, but um, coming from a tribe uh, of post-abolition um, peoples that had to remake themselves, that is the Creole people from Sierra Leone, 
who were made up of an amalgamation of freed slaves and various other migrants. They had to reform themselves almost entirely from scratch, really. And they had to do it with Western concepts, with um, indigenous, from memory. They had to bring all of these together. Now, some of us do not want to be Western. We really don't. Um, we want to be more like the Japanese that select what they feel is useful and continue evolving what they feel is theirs. And the issue with de-Westernization or a resistance to it in Sierra Leone anyway is that many of us have never had the choice to be Western or to decide either way. We haven't been given that choice. It's just there. It's just been, you know, through the education system, Shakespeare, etc., etc. So that's all I wanted to say. Not all of us really want to be Western. Thank you. And we have one more. Uh, hi, my name is Olivia Burdak from the University of Edinburgh. Um, since I've got one of the last one, I wanted to continue with some problematizing some of the concepts used. We've already talked about it, this uh, deorientalization, de orientalism. So the other concept that I would like to address again is um, citizenship. Um, it's throughout this conference uh, we've talked about you know oblivious citizens, citizens who don't know they're citizens, um, yet are still by us presumed to be enacting um, citizenship. So it seems to me that the difference between politics and citizenship has been collapsed. If we're no longer referring to people as parts of collectivities in which they know they're participating because they're trying to change um, you know, some kind of relationship between themselves and the state, they don't even know they're a part of the state, um, then, then wh why citizenship? What are, what are the limits or maybe what are the problems of expanding it so much um, in the sense that um, maybe we could just use anything else. Maybe it's just a borough pol politics. If, it's, if, that, if what we want to do is basically enact political subjectivity or impose on people a political subjectivity of people as agents bearing rights. Because I presume that this is what connects everything, um, all the discussions here. We would like people to think of themselves or, or, or act as, as some, someone who has rights. So, so, so there are some tensions here that I don't know if you'd like to address. Okay, Maida is going to add something to that last comment. I will speak in the, I'm Maida, um, yeah, no. um, one thing the last point reminded me is one of the things that we lacked emphasizing, except Bella's uh, presentation, I think we seem to be all taking the Western metropolis as our point of reference. And in doing so, we are neglecting a fundamental issue, that is the subaltern in the third world space, whose citizenship, whose claims for right and right to have rights even, uh, are absolutely severed. And uh, when we are discussing issues of citizenship, again, I'm saying, in other words, that we are suffering from this Anglo-American cultural studies discourse, taking migrancy, taking Western metropolis, taking diaspora as our, I'm including myself as well, uh, as our point of reference and neglecting the other side of the sea. Thanks very much. Very easy questions. <laughs> um, do, do you want to add? Okay, so let's... Oh, sorry, I missed that. Okay. Hi, um, Lytton Smith from Plymouth University. Thank you to all for your thoughts and all the speakers and for more time for questions. Um, I just wanted to add something for going forward, which I think is 
been uh, latent or implicit, occasionally addressed. Um, the idea of translation or translating, um, if we can take the in from deorientalizing. Um, think, thinking about um, uh, partly the question of listening. How is it that we listen to one another? But also um, bringing in um, one of Etienne Balabar's ideas, if he has these four work sites of democracy, and for him, one of the, the playful questions he poses is that the idea of the language of Europe might have to be translation, not itself a, a language, but a way of interacting. Um, it's very mischievous, I think, on his part, because how do we use that in a meaningful way to have a conversation with one another? But it, it strikes me as very, very necessary, and particularly if we're trying to... Because I, I hear another sense, that Ingen, you began with sort of senses of the D in deorientalizing, and I, I almost want to also bring in that Latin root of, of de, meaning, you know, de rerum, you know, about, the, you know, the aboutness. So about orientalizing would be another thing that I think is going on rather than accepting orientalizing. And uh, translation seems to be useful to that. Thanks very much. Um, Ale, you, you seem like you want to come in and, and say something. Ale is one of the members of the project, so go ahead. I don't, know, I don't know if I'm timely or not, because I wanted to, um, for example, respond a bit to Maida, but I don't know if that's the right time or we want to take more questions um, we, first. We don't want to take more questions, but I'd okay. like to give... I sneeze. Um, excuse me. Um, we want to give a chance to the panel. Uh, but. Then you can come in, respond directly to uh, Maida. Dina, did you have along those lines? Okay, so I'll bring you in. Okay, we have a number of questions. They are um, each um, in their own way challenging questions singly, but also collectively together. I think they also uh, pose some quite significant methodological, epistemological, political questions. And what I'd like to do is to give a chance to the panel, starting with Zaki and then moving this way. And you can pick and choose which ones you want to respond to. Okay, I'll do my best to uh, respond to all of them. <laughs> that have, that's addressed to me. <laughs> that's addressed to me. Okay, um, firstly, Maida's questions. Um, Firstly, Orientalism not applicable to Africa. Um, taking, although we're taking a, a non saiyan concept of Orientalism, personally, um, I don't feel I am in my work. In, um, when I've looked at um, Edmund Burke's idea of Orientalism, um, he drew specifically upon um, William Jones. He's, he's talking specifically as an Orientalist in the traditional sense. And although I can see where that question came from because I mentioned Fanon and um, and what's that got to do with Orientalism, you know? Um, I think there's two senses of the term Orientalism working, that I'm working with. One is a Saiyan sense of Orientalism, meaning um, this kind of cultural exoticization of the other, the domination of the feminized, inferior, barbaric other, that side that connects. Another sense of Orientalism is um, what Engin calls uh, political Orientalism. So in that sense, um, political Orientalism is working with an idea of citizenship, as being um, constructed against uh, an East, a despotic East. So that's linked to Orientalism in Said's sense as well, because Orientalism was about um, colonial administrators saying, you know, we have James Mill, or John Stuart Mill talking about, you know, we have a superior representative form of government, these are unfit to govern because, you know, they're despotic Eastern. Now, um, when I talk about um, Fanon's um, idea of, when I say that he was, not he was Orientalist, but that um, he, he didn't speak to Orientalism at all. I completely agree. It's got nothing to do with it. He spoke to racism, he spoke to colonialism, but he didn't speak to political Orientalism. He still assumed that there was a certain model of um, thinking about political subjectivity, and that model was, there's a, not a despotic ease, but there's that a tribe, there's an idea of um, people that aren't citizens, and we need to accelerate their consciousness, as he, as he calls it. He, he uses those specific terms. Not talking about man, which everyone remembers him for, but his chapter on when he's talking about national unity, when he's talking about um, you know, resisting the comprador class, resisting all these kind of arguments. He's, he's invoking an idea of citizenship. Um, another question that 
question about multiculturalism. Um, yeah, uh, obviously, um, I completely agree with um, culture as uh, as developed in the colonial context. You know, you can keep your culture; we're just going to take your gold. Yeah, that's that's an idea of how cultural difference was used as a form of um, government in colonial times. Um, but the more problematic one that I had trouble answering is um, starting with a natural idea of culture from within like Western sciences, I think you put it, like although multiculturalism, I'm starting from this idea of anthropology even, and it's all located within the West. And multiculturalism, yes, it is. Um, my project doesn't, um, doesn't seek to look elsewhere. It seeks to look within the West and see how um, citizenship after Orientalism is about um, <laughs> deorientalizing, <laughs> deorientalizing um, how the West has attempted to do it. There's been this, we tend to forget there's a specific moment like with communitarianism where the West has suddenly um, come to this realization saying that there's uh, there's different ways of being political and not just cultural, but different ways of being political. Or even libertarianism, there's different ways of being political. And that should somehow, it's a, it's a way of the West addressing Orientalism. And that, that's what I wanted to explore. Um, that's why I feel that when Engin characterized my project as undoing, I wanted to see how the West is trying to undo Orientalism. I'm not saying that that's, that's even remotely achieves what um, people, the, the rest of our project, the project is doing, such as uncovering or, or invent or looking at the interventive moments of it. So that's I didn't address your question very well, but <laughs> the the last one, um, the neglect of the sub subaltern. I thought that was a really important question, and it, it's as though we're taking the metropole. We're, we're focusing on that. We're not focusing on the subaltern. Um, what I'm trying to look at now is um, three aspects of citizenship. The first is people that are claiming imperial citizenship, as Sukanya talks about in the first panel. Um, there's these people, these aren't subalterns. These are the middle class um, elite subalterns. Uh, let's talk in, in subaltern studies, and the native elite, <laughs> you know. Um, and then there's people that are speaking about acts of citizenship. These, these aren't subaltern either, because um, we're immediately framing it into a discourse of citizenship. And this is not, it, that's not what subaltern subaltern studies was about, it's about um, lang those people that couldn't be assimilated into those languages of, of political discourse. It's those that see those that are outside. Now, what I want to look at as well, and what I'm looking at now, is looking at how people um, enacted politics in ways that cannot be placed into either imperial citizenship, acts of citizenship, or, citizen or just general liberal and uh, communitarian and civil social political rights. These are um, people, for instance, in uh, Mauritius in the um, 1840s, not the people that submitted petitions to government, but the people that um, were literally spoken for, um, the people that were um, almost, they were present in the petitions, their names were signed, they don't have any narratives, they're spoken for. These are um, subaltern, um, subaltern acts of citizenship or something similar. And that's a, that's a real difficulty, to try and incorporate that into analysis. I mean, Spivak found that hard, but I'm um, finding it harder to try and actually not talk about theoretically, but talking about subalternity as a political kind of statement. I, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, OK, it's rather difficult to answer all the questions. So I'll pick up something issues. Um, um, uh, following up um, Zaki's comment, that um, uh, issue of uh, subaltern, uh, we didn't really address to subaltern the real cause. I don't really see that, for example, uh, Ale's work, uh, article was on uh, Adivasi's tribal populations, and I work on rural India. And so as a category, as a people, we might be able to say they are subalterns too. They're not certainly metropolitan, they're not uh, diasporic, they are not English speaking. But at the same time, I want to say um, I feel that there's a danger at this categorization of subalterns as well. And I think in, within the subaltern studies, even, I think the, the idea of subaltern is uh, considered to be more relational category 
not really this particular group can be called subaltern, but it's its relation to certain local power structure. So, of course, it depending on what kind of um, situation we were talking about. So, we could even say elite, say uh, Indian prince, which I worked on before, like Maharajas, vis-a-vis, um, -vis, say, British power, they can be subalterns, but of course in the local uh, society, they oppress, they can be oppressor. So, uh, I'm not entirely happy with this category of subaltern. I think we should, we should be careful and we should question that too. And another thing is, um, um, I'm not in a position to answer for uh, Charles, but he didn't talk about uh, these musicians. Actually, it is not secular Islam at all. They actually, most of them convert into Islam. So it is a religious Islam too. So this is not just Europe can accept if it is like a cultural, if it is secular, they can accept as a kind of, you know, as a, I don't know, like a, a part of en, 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 um, entertainment or something. This is actually a much more committed act. So that's that, that's what I can say. So um, so this is not just um, um, and, and 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 move to the issue of um, secularism. And several people pointed out why you don't talk about secularism. Um, I'm not sure secularism is really a useful analytical tool. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to say, and it is very probably controversial, and, and especially within South Asian studies, so much argument, so much discussion have been done as coming notes. And so do we need to? to so that is one of the uh, responses. Do we, do we have anything to add to that? And another thing is that if I go to, whenever I go to these ro local matters, people say their matters, their monasteries are secular. So their idea of secular is different from European sense of secular. And if you go to Japan, Japanese sense of secular is different. And in you know, because I mean, in, India, in, in Indian context, what they mean secular means they're not casteist. We don't care about caste. Everybody can come to these monasteries or religious institutions, whatever. So that's their idea of secular. That's nothing to do with religion uh, in a European sense. So, and, and even this institution, I'm really, you know, I often describe as a religious institution, but I'm not really sure it is really religious. And so, Secularism kind of implies that there is a clear distinction between politics and religion, and of course, as we know, it is not. And in Indian context, for example, when they talk about dharma, it is, is, it, is it moral? Yes. Is it religion? Yes. It is way of doing politics? Yes. All of that, and the people do use this term. And how do we um, recognize that, and how do we have come a proper conversation with this world. Well, it is, again, this is not really close world. This is not some, I, I don't really want to essentialize, orientalize, but how can we have a conversation with this language? That's my problem. And there is always danger that uh, I might be essentializing, I might be orientalizing. There's always danger. But, but what I want to say is we were not, talking about from Euro-American centric or metropolitan point of view, we try to um, take local issues quite seriously. Thank you, Aya. Okay. I have this problem of many things to say and then I am paralyzed and I don't know how to start. But I will start with the after. I hope... I, Maybe I didn't articulate very well the idea that I was going, I, I was trying to convey it, but basically it had to do with the traveling of the after and how traveling the after is for us as a project with, with this cast, this many, many sessions and the risks of this after when it is thrown to an audience that doesn't share our history of discussions 
and the risk of finding in this after a trajectory, a certain unidirectionality in the trajectory and how to bring here the ambiguity that the after has for us. Even now, I, I was thinking you now in terms of looking after, going after, in, in a way as a project we have been looking after citizenship, after Orientalism. Anyway, and this, uh, so, and there are other uh, figures that appeared even in the presentation uh, after, well, that I took on it but also without and also beyond, and they're very different. And we have these differences and these discussions within the project. If we can understand an after us beyond, really, can we? I would argue with you. And we had these <laughs> arguments already. So this um, way to enter a dialogue with, with you, Meda. Mm -hmm. So the second point you referred to in relation not only to the after, and this goes to the deorientalizing, which was the title of this symposium and not the title of this, the project, and not necessarily a position with which the project identifies with. It had to do with putting into dialogue certain post-colonial trajectories and certain decolonial perspectives. So it, in a way, it's put, it, it, it was a way, well, at least, at, that's the way I understood it, to put that tension as one of the central aspects that we're going to be happening here. So in relation to that, um, and the specificity of the terms, and so I understand what you say about Orientalism and I agree on that, and I personally have my issues with certain ideas of politics of resignification that can be kind of maniac in a way, really optimistic. Terms are overloaded, they have their own historicity, and it's not so easy to resignify. But at the same time, resignification has to do with actual struggles and also intellectual struggles. So I'm not so sure that a term, because it has, of course, its historicity, and, not, and it's not so easily uh, resignifiable within its circulation, it has to remain itself along the years. That would be, uh, uh, we can continue arguing on that. And in relation to that, for example, you gave the example of queer in the nation or these figures. I would say that on the contrary, queer and nation had everything to do from the beginning, or at least the beginning of if you want to, the hegemonic stories of the US story of the queer, but also Moraga or Ansaldua, who brought the queer in relation to the nation. So, yes, of course, which brings me to queer. Decolonizing. I was thinking in decolonizing rather than deorientalizing, or well, um, which for my personal project within the project it is, of course, since for me, or I depart from the hypothesis that if not, of course, ontologically, sexual citizenship is an orientalist construct already, it works as an orientalist construct, and the emergence of the discourse of sexual citizenship work along the lines of orientalizing practices, which brings me back to the specificity of orientalism and the tension with other colonial logics, because at the same time what happens is that discourses and practices feed into each other and travel and circulate. So for instance, in the case of the development of modern or postmodern sexual citizenship, you can find ways of orientalizing other populations that are not in the Orient or are not specifically Islamic. And you can find parallel logics. Of course they are different. Of course they are different. But you can make, um, you can make or put things into dialogue in some way. You know, well. 
Um, which brings me to my last point, which is the fields and translation. And yes, the political and whether we are working with a notion, stretching the notion of citizenship to extent that it collapses with the idea of the political. Also, long discussions about it and you know how to determine one field or the other. And to that, I want to pose two thoughts. On the one hand, there's a risk that I don't know, but I am just you know think a very classical anthropological risk or question, which is. The epistemic violence that supposed that supposed to attribute X practice as either a political one or a non-political one, for that matters, even you know from a very critical perspective, a very progressive, a very blah blah blah. When you are bringing, in one way or or another, a notion of that field, being it the political or citizenship that doesn't belong to the context where the practice takes place. Very classic and anthropological question. At the same time, the last point is about fields and translation. One of the problems of cultural translation to me is that most of the time the debates on cultural translation are more focused or are mainly focused on the question of subject positions or identity. And forget, in a way, the fields in which those identities of, or subject positions make sense. For instance, the distance, the difference between citizen and citizenship as a subject position, as a field of struggles or practices and how to think about one and the other. Another one, sexuality. So one thing is to work or uh, question the ways in which certain ways of being sexual are being translated from one context but to still, the other. But there's but still, another problem, which is which is the notion of sexuality which is, which is the as a field that is working in different, or in our translation, when we try to make sense of different ways of being sexual. What's that being sexual mean? That can be translated, of course it needs to be translated, or, or of course it needs to go through a process of cultural translation. Most of the time, this is more difficult than saying he trans, gay, transgender, so on and so forth. So what's the way of being, or what sexuality means in the context of, so it's not just about transgender or other term, or, so I will leave it there. Okay, so, Thank you, Enka, for your comments. And I'm not sure why I put Oh Baby up there. It was just some kind of joke, but thanks for making me seem smart. <laughs> like it was a, a great gesture. Um, but it is interesting, the, the point that you bring up about categorization, because I think it relates to this infantilization. So what I want to talk about in relation to this question that you brought up about categorization. So David Cameron recently um, launched this plan called Gay Conditionality, where he, the idea is, is that countries in the global south will have to institute LGBTQ rights or their funding could be stripped, their aid funding. And then subsequently several homophobic comments were made by um, specifically some political leaders in Africa and you know, for, please forgive me, I can't remember the exact countries, but there were a few comments made and then it started this kind of um, public debate about this. But what's interesting is this categorization, that this LGBTQ categorization is being used now to potentially strip people of aid in the global south. And so this idea of infantilization, of the kind of subject that has not yet arrived, right, that is not a sexual subject, that needs to, you know, grow up and wave a rainbow flag, is now being used by a political leader to then threaten aid funding. So I think this idea of categories is really important in the sense you can see that certain Western categories are mobilized to assume that people, you know, if you are not translated into a language of legal right, Western secular English legal right, that you have not arrived. You need to be, and he even said, David Cameron said, I think we are all on a journey 
and we need to help these countries on their journey. So this language of temporality is used again. David Cameron, the Pied Piper of sexual rights, is now making this argument that he's helping people on a journey. But it, I mean, it's obviously a ruse to pull funding in a time of austerity. So the categorization is important, which is why I think looking at hijras and other forms of sexual subjectivity beyond or outside of these categories of right is extremely important. Because it also means that we reconceive of who we think has arrived, but also who we think is a mature sexual subject. And it's also about history then, right? That hijras have a long history that predates colonialism. That sexual subjects and sexual politics in India existed long before David Cameron came along to say, like, oh, I'm going to help you on your journey by pulling your aid funding. So I think this is extremely important. In terms of um, Islam, I also, this is something I'm interested in my work because the concept of hijra itself is an Islamic concept. Hijras have a lineage in um, Hindu and Muslim culture. The word hijra also means pilgrimage. So this is something that I'm also interested in taking up in my work. And finally, I think what is interesting, this idea of who wants to be Western kept coming up. I heard this a couple of times. We want to be Western, we don't want to be Western. But I think one has to trouble this idea of choice and agency versus global capitalism. Does one want to be Western or does one want to survive within a global capitalist economy in which to not be Western often means a threat to one's survival? I'm not as familiar as I am with India, but what's really interesting is that recently the Pakistani government has taken hijras and is using hijras as tax collectors, which is like this, it's really because hijras, you know, shame people, and there was an example of, oh, I'm gonna laugh if I see a hijra, because people have this deep anxiety, right, around non-normative sexuality. And so because they have this anxiety, in order to get people to pay their taxes, they're sending hijras around because people are so scared that the hijras will show the genitals that they're paying their taxes. So these, these examples that are quite interesting where you can see that you know, this kind of like non-normative figure is being used by the government of Pakistan in this way, that's quite interesting. But at the same time, what you're saying is also true that in order to get, but this is about global capitalism as well. So hijras in India are increasingly calling themselves transgendered because they want funding. Because they want funding from major LGBTQ organizations. Because they want to be on the BBC and like call it, you know, Lady Gaga will come and shake their hand. Like this is global capitalism. And if you don't translate yourself into a language that's intelligible to, you know, who has money and who has power in the world, then you often can't survive. to refer also to the question of, uh, of the danger of considering everything political that uh, uh, Nicolo mentioned somewhere behind this, this sun <laughs> we have here. Um, and it's a question I, I also uh, reflected on the previous research on the sans papiers in Spain and especially in the, law, in the legal field because there is also this danger of considering everything legal. Uh, all kind of customary law, it's directly considered law. So anthropologists, sociologists of law have 
thought about that, have discussed, have uh, struggled. And one of the, the there are different interpretations, different uh, ways to come out of this puzzle. But one is uh, what the actors consider themselves. Do, are they considering they are legal actors? Are they political actors? That could be that can be uh, interpreted at least from what they say. And another option is what the the, the, the writer, the, the researcher interprets. If if it's political or if it's legal, that I think Engin has had said something uh, similar to that. And then another option I would suggest is to consider that those struggles are political, are legal. When, not always, or, but not, and not necessarily, but when they affect the, de the legal and political agenda, when they intervene, when they affect, when they uh, contest, when they change uh, the legal and political agenda, pretending or not to do that. So a struggle could be political when the next day or the next month or whenever the politician or some kind of institution changes uh, the attitude or the a rule or whatever, and at the same time, an act would be or legal in the sense of legality, not in the terms of legal or illegal, but as an act of legality when it affects to the legal agenda, when the process of law of, of is in is alter is uh, change, and so yeah, basically. Yeah. Thanks, Iker. Now, um, Alessandra and Dina have been waiting patiently. Now, I want to give. Where is it? Yeah? Okay. Uh, continuing some of the uh, concerns that were raised, I'm a bit troubled with the deorientalizing focus rather than the decolonizing. Um, and in that sense, again, the recentering of Europe, and I see the deorientalizing being part of the decolonizing, and I think it part, it's part of the tendency of going post in the post. And <laughs> recently, I'm beginning to be more and more convinced after different conferences that while there is an emphasis that the post is not necessarily a post as an after, that actually a post as an after world is being produced constantly in this kind of literature. Um, and in that sense, I, I express my concern also on, again, this tendency of, of academia to jump forward and we're still li living in, in kind of colonial world. Uh, speaking of colonial construction of identities, as the example of Hedra is, is showing and the epistemic violence, the imperial epistemic violence that is inflicting constantly. The second point is the whole idea of the imposed citizenship, which was, again, not, um, not really explored. And I think one of the main issues is also the trajectory of of the colonial exclusion through citizenship, where citizenship was designed to exclude and continue to exclude. And while people emphasized the exclusion, there was also kind of reaffirmation of citizenship as a framework at the same time, um, which for me seems something a bit troubling because in some cases, citizenship bounds people and Bound the, bounds them as political subject and bounds their political imagination. And actually, citizenship acts as these boundaries that need to be transcended. I, I work on Palestinian citizenship in Israel, for example, and for me, this is an example of colonially constructed citizenship, which only bounds the political imagination and it needs to be transcended to be able to achieve freedom. So, in, in that sense, um, 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 I wanted to kind of uh, emphasize this. Thank you.
Okay, the last I think I'm going to give uh, Ale and Dina, and we will need to close the session very um, as soon. We don't have many minutes left. Uh, can I? Can I just? Okay. Um, I will be very quick. Um, I think we have a tendency to look at the construction of citizenship um, following moments of what I call social disruption. When we, and that is when we actually see how uh, marginalized groups are agitating for inclusion. But what happens between moments of social disruption I think is equally important for how citizenship and inclusion is uh, being constituted. And uh, this is something that I have uh, a problem doing myself. So I wanted to see how the panel um, is, is able to think about formations of citizenship when those formations are uh, the least visible to the, uh, to the eye of the researcher and the Thank you. Alessandra? All right. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for this discussion because it's really what we were hoping for when we uh, thought about this space, uh, to be very dialogical. And also what we intended to do, uh, framing the title as a question. The Orientalizing Citizenship was embedded with a risk and was embedded with a sort of like an invitation to this dialogue. And the subtitle just expresses that, experiments. We weren't looking for a um, finished kind of definition of citizenship after Orientalism. After more than one year and a half, I don't think we, <laughs> we, we really like ended up be agreeing on what we are looking at and neither we are agreeing on the methodologies that we, each of us is using to un answer the questions that um, Engin posed at the beginning. But those very questions were at stake for us all along. And only after one year and a half, we actually were able to formulate them in a collective meeting. And I think that is what we were trying to put on the table rather than an idea of the after that can kind of um, mimic post-structuralist or deconstructionist methods. That's not what, really what we were trying to do. And I just wanted to uh, clarify that. On the other hand, I don't know where it's made up. <sighs> no. <laughs> well. I wanted to respond to the uh, to two things, you know, that she brought up, and I think they are crucial points: the idea of the subaltern and the idea of um, Orientalism. And I and I want to say that I think it's a an, it would be an important thing to not be very orthodox with these labels. If we want to use analytical context, uh, uh, concepts, not as labels, but as analytical tools, so mobilizing them, we can't be that orthodox with them. And I'm referring both to the idea of the subaltern. If we critique that there is an hegemony of the um, Anglo-American cultural studies context, then the first, th the first thing is not to reclaim the idea of the subaltern, because the idea of the subaltern is embedded with this, this inheritance, is embedded with this um, strength. And what do we mean by subaltern? Uh, my paper that was in, on the first day was about the tribals, uh, was about the denotified tribals in India. Oddly enough, we were, that relates to the orthodoxy of Orientalism. Oddly enough, I am perfectly located for the idea of, the, of, of Saidian Orientalism. What's better than India to explain the orientalized idea of the Hindu effeminate male or the woman that cannot speak because she is the object of uh, colonial um, laws and at the same time she's rescued from the Saati um, and 
you know, it's like I am perfectly located for that. But I deal with tribal populations and indigenous people, and that isn't something that I dealt with. So I want to just put a question mark close to the idea of geographically bounding Orientalism to certain spaces, because there is an outside of, the, of what we consider the Oriental outside from the metropolitan uh, standpoint that she was criticizing. So that is, I think, a very important uh, thing to think about. And if I can just add something to this mobilization of Orientalism, I think um, most of the people that presented here during the, in the three panels took up the challenge of talking about citizenship and Orientalism and used the Orientalism in different contexts, in different struggles, but as, a, a, as an analytical tool that was pushing citizenship to its limits. From there, there are a lot of different strands and a lot of different positions with, which we don't need and we don't even want to unify. But they posed other uh, challenges and challenges, for example, to language, to the language of citizenship as well as Bella, Bella on the one hand was like proliferating with attributes to citizens, um, oblivious citizens, rebellious citizens, and, uh, and all the rest. While we had um, Anke that was say, maybe we should just get rid of the word citizen and talk about citizenship as a, a site, of, site of struggle. I think that is the kind of thinking that is enabled by the use of Orientalism not in an orthodox way, but as a, an analytical tool. And I think that's where that question mark has been useful, and that phrasing of the orientalizing as a challenge has been taken up. And I think I'm really uh, grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ale. Dina? OK. Um, as well on the question of um, the political and the risk that we come to see everything as political. And I think precisely when we come to think that we're risking seeing everything as political, the question needs to be, um, why, why are we not looking at how and why and who gets to recognize what is political and, or not? And I think that was Garminder Barbambra's question this morning. And I think I addressed it in my paper as well because my concern was political legibility as well. So in Bamber's paper, if I understood her correctly, um, what she was concerned with was if we come to see not just as citizens, but citizenship as a field constituted by making claims, then you know we're, we're risking putting two domains, um, one that and you can only cross over into political legibility once you make a claim. And I think in my paper, um, that question interrogated me. I concluded with the Arendtian question of what of the right to have rights? And to me, if the last 10 or 15 years that you referred to, Engen, have been enabled by putting the focus on that first right, so what of the right to have rights, that claim, then to me, citizenship being part of Ocumeni um, is now putting the em emphasis on the what if. So what, sorry, what of? So what of the right to have rights? How that idea of looking for claiming has made us sort of um, look to political intelligibility and you know, recognize politics in a certain way. And then in relation to um, uh, citizenship and whether that's a conflation as well, the way I did it was through um, the relationship to text in a way. So um, the, the traditions of reading politics through um, Greek texts, uh, tra uh, tragic texts like Antigone, for example, which has been used to think about politics. So I experimented this reading of texts with tellings. So tellings of hakaya, hakaya being Arabic for tales. And um, I used three hakaya, one from 8th century Cairo, uh, Baghdad, 13th century Cairo, and 20th century Morocco that constitute Arabic oral and dramatic traditions. And it was, so when I told the theory of the public sphere, 
um, and not just the bourgeois white male, but sort of the feminist subaltern um, a citizen who was recognized for making claims and for organizing. And of course, just quickly on your point, um, so the subject of public spheres is recognized as a political subject. And even the subject of the feminist subaltern counter public is recognized as a political subject for making claims. And now why do we not conflate them? Why, if I want to say, speak of a subject in my tellings of Hakaya that are not recognized, why are they not conflated? Because each of these, like Garminder made clear, has a history. And if we conflate them now, then we forget that the points of their, as their struggles, their histories of struggles with each other as well. So if we conflate the terms now, we risk subjugating these histories of struggle in their encounter. So I think, and that goes back to the continuity. So to me, if I come back with this relation to text, to the project's theme, which has um, received so much um, critique, citizenship after Orientalism, and do I look at it as a subject, as an academic, as a subject that knows about and wants to come and sort of analyze it? Or do I look at it as stagings? Stagings that, um, that enable the paradox to remain open. And it is within that paradox and keeping the paradox open through stagings, not readings of what citizenship and Orientalism and after means, but telling them and these stages that enable experimentation that to me is necessary for me to reflect on myself, not just as a subject that knows about, but a subject that knows herself in the process. Thanks, Dina. Well, thanks very much for all the interventions, all the questions and, and the responses. Um, we are just at the end of our session. Um, it's been uh, responded to, but the particular question, especially with um, um, Olivia, uh, Olivia and and um, uh, Nicola, I, they are actually related questions, which was then rejoined by uh, I don't know her name, but the uh, Palestinian citizenship. You talked about post citizenship. There are two dangers that are being talked about. One is uh, where do we draw the lines between uh, collapsing everything that that there is into political. Is everything political? And then the question of, uh, is everything political about citizenship? So the, there's two, um, two dangers of, of collapsing. And I think I uh, don't have time to really respond uh, to those, but I think enough thoughts that have been offered to occasion uh, reflections on the question. And clearly, being able to raise those questions as questions is really significant. Because in, in many contexts and spaces where those questions go without saying, as though uh, what cons is constituted by the political is self-evident, and what constitutes citizenship is self-evident, is often the assumption with which uh, the discussion uh, proceeds. Having articulated those to ourselves as questions to grapple with and troubled by, is a good sign, is the note that I want to end this uh, session with. Thanks very much for the dialogue, thanks very much for the questions, and I had promised that I would also reflect on the question of um, uh, Mignola posed, um, what do we want? So I will keep that to the conclusion uh, to keep you a little bit longer in suspense. Thanks very much.